Dr. Pennebaker, thank you so much for joining us here on Mindfulness Channel. And um, I, before we get started here and have you speak a little bit about yourself and um, the amazing work that you've been doing, is I do need to share a story here with you. And I'm wondering whether I can start with that on why I actually find you fascinating and um, in many sense, I'm grateful to you. And uh, as I, when I first met you, I was, um, I was able to let you know how thankful I was. So let me just share with the viewers and you on what I, sh uh, what I shared with you initially when we met. So one of the things most people don't know, and uh, I shared this with Dr. Ben Baker, and I don't think, I don't even know and my mom knows this. Now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, mom. Um, so let me share this with you. When uh, Dr. Ben Baker and, and uh, viewers here, is when I lost my brother, um, his name was Colin. We had lost him and that month or that um, semester I was taking a class in psychology. And after the death of my brother, was, he was about a thousand feet away from the home and it was a tragic death. He fell asleep and ran across the road um, as he came around the corner. But the, the most important detail here with his death was that um, I started to fall apart and couldn't concentrate in class and I'm one of those guys that I don't, I don't take a licking for nothing. I, I keep on ticking. And I tried that, my best to push through this, but something started to happen. I started to have restless nights. I started to break down. I started to have anger outbursts um, at the smallest things in traffic. Um, I remember waiting in line and just losing it. And I thought, what is this? This is not me. And everyone in my family was grieving, of course, my mom and dad. And for whatever reason, um, that day I decided to go to class. <laughs> and uh, my professor then was talking about this fellow named James Ben Baker. And he started to talk about how something called expressive writing can shift someone's emotions, can release it. And, I, and he even spoke about the, what got me was the biology, because I was big onto the biology. And I started to listen in and, um, and I basically had no clear instructions, except what the instructor told me was, don't write more than 20 minutes, something to that effect. I remember hearing 10, 20. I just basically wrote until I decided to, but I wrote for four consecutive days, uh, taking breaks in between my writing. I did not know why, it was just intuitively, it was exhausting. And, um, and something shifted, and I know it's ridiculous, but something shifted within two weeks inside of me. I started sleeping. I started feeling like myself again. And then I realized, I looked around my family, they were still grieving. I was grieving, but it wasn't, I wasn't drunk in it. I wasn't stuck in it. So with that official long-winded introductory, Dr. Pamela Baker, it's a sincere, heartful thank you to you and the work that you've done. Welcome, Dr. James Pamela Baker. Thank you so much, <laughs> Leslie. And I should also say, uh, you, you had mentioned that you told me this story last time we spoke. Yeah. And I was, and I am so touched by it. It's, it's one of these things that uh, hearing stories like this, it just makes me uh, so grateful that I came across this and that it, that it's had the impact. Yeah. It has. It's, and, and, um, it, and if you only knew how many, um, now that I'm a licensed psychologist, uh, I specialize in pain management, uh, my patients know you very directly and intimately because um, I don't share the story, but now it's out. Um, but now they'll really know why I'm very big on expressive writing, not because it's some lightweight, foo-foo, psychobabble, but there's science behind it. So let's get into it. Um, let's do the exciting part. I love hearing, um, how did you get started in this? Because I, when, I, when I first read and even talked to you, I thought, you know, there was this profound shift where, you know, something from, from the sky fell and you said, this is what I'm going to research. How did you bump into expressive writing versus studying some other social aspect? Tell us, please. So, so uh, it's important to appreciate that I come from, um, you know, I, I went to college planning to go to law school. I majored in every semester. My junior year, I came across an introductory psychology book and read it and thought, wow, this is exactly what I wanted to do. But I was interested in social psychology. Mm -hmm. Went to graduate school in social psychology, never took a clinical course. I always was a little suspicious of those <laughs> clinicians. They were just a little bit too uh, touchy-feely for me. And, uh, <laughs> and then 
but I was interested in mind body problems. So, and um, I started off studying physical symptoms and I was writing a book and I, uh, one thing led to another. And I started to discover that people who were keeping really big secrets had lots of health problems and lots of symptoms. And, uh, and I became fascinated by this. I did a, what, what ended up being a, a, a national survey, not a good national survey, but a, a big one. But I discovered that people who had had major traumatic experiences that they didn't talk about were more likely to be diagnosed with cancer, high blood pressure, colds, flus, major problems, minor problems. And I became interested in this. Why is a secret so unhealthy? And um, it, be, it was particularly apparent in people who had had traumatic sexual experiences. Mm. They couldn't talk to anybody. And uh, I had one case, who I, a, a woman I interviewed who talked about this experience when she was young, that um, her, her father, her mother had divorced her father when she was about two years old and the mother then remarried when she was about 12. And uh, she'd never seen her mother so happy and a year or two into that marriage, uh, so now she was about 14, mm -hmm. she woke up in the middle of the night and the stepfather, who was drunk, was pawing her and wow. starting to molest her. And she, she uh, didn't know what to do. She couldn't, she knew she told her mother it would break her heart, so she didn't say anything. And this started to happen night after night. And she couldn't tell her friends at school because they would never understand, never understand it. And so she, by keeping it secret, she was essentially pushing her mother away from her, her friends away from her, and she was becoming more and more isolated. And I started to realize that keeping this secret isolates you, even though you're right. around, people, you just can't connect with them. And um, what's, this, all of this started to make me wonder, what if we had people come into the lab and just write about or talk about this uh, major life events that they've kept secret or they haven't talked to others about in, in detail. And at this time, I started to talk to clinical psychologists for the first time. I was doing these case studies and, uh, and I'd had my own experience of, uh, you know, I've been married a very, very long time, but uh, even if you've been married a very, very long time, you all marriages, all relationships have up and downs, and especially early on, mm -hmm. those ups are fabulous, the downs are horrible. Uh, now, 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 now the, the roller coaster is much smoother. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I remember early on getting into a very serious uh, fight about some fundamental marriage issues with with my wife and going in and just spontaneously starting to write about it what's going on and so forth and I was amazed how different I felt afterwards anyway this was several years before I started to do the first writing study so the idea was well clearly holding things back is bad for you for all these different reasons right and maybe just writing it could make a difference and so I did a study just to see if that was true and the first study we had people they came in and by a flip of the coin they were asked to either write about the most traumatic experience they've had that they haven't talked much about to anybody or they were asked to write about superficial topics and I had people write for four times uh, once a day for 15 minutes in the laboratory and um, the study worked. And we, in that study, we asked people to get, we got permission from them to uh, track how many times they went to the student health center for illness in the months before the writing and in the months afterwards. In that study, we found that those people who wrote about these traumatic experiences ended up going to the doctor at about half the rate. As wow, people. that is amazing. And so that, that was the first study. And then our second study we did a year later, and this time we drew blood and we analyzed, uh, look for immune system changes. And I was working with some psychoimmunologists at the time. 
and we got uh, immune changes and also doctor changes. And then, and then this thing just started growing. Other labs started to do this expressive writing and, and it just started to build this move beyond college students who started working with real people and people in different cultures and people with very different kinds of problems. And it's now a, a very well established phenomenon. But more uh, about the do's and don'ts now that we know there's signs behind this. Um, and so mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got a couple of questions from my um, patients. And they will, and they ask them. One of the big things: Could you tell us, um, you know, do we write in the morning, first thing in the morning, kind of like I meditate in the morning? Is like, is that the best time to do it? So the do's and don'ts, the timelines, and also if you get somewhere along the line, just let us know um, if I was bilingual, um, you know, maybe second generation, something like that, or third generation, but I'm speaking another language and I'm fluent in both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, could you guide us on that? Because I wanted to uh, add a cultural factor to this because many of my patients come from different walks of life. Could you talk to that, please? Sure. Let, let me start off kind of the bigger picture here. Um, what's been interesting for me in terms of expressive writing is when I started off, I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I just had this intuition that writing could be good for me. And it, Intuitively, it seemed like writing more times than just once would probably make sense. Mm -hmm. I had people write four times for 15 minutes a time because I had act, I wanted to run the entire study in five days. The first day people filled out questionnaires. The second, then that would give me Tuesday through Friday uh, for them to uh, write. And I was only able to get rooms, uh, enough rooms where people could write uh, in the late afternoon. So if I, I calculated, if I started at four in the afternoon and ran people you know, in this, this way, in an assembly line way, I could be finished by nine or 10 at night. Wow. And, and uh, each person would write, you know, I calculated how many rooms, you know, I have this many rooms, I have these many people helping me have this and this, uh, and I calculated that I could get, uh, they, there'd be enough time for them to write 15 minutes. The study worked. Wow. Now, there's, in other words, I was not, okay, it's gotta be 15 minutes. And then the next, <laughs> the next time I did it, you know, I thought, well, uh, if I start this way and start on Sunday, I could add another five minutes, they could write 20 minutes. Here's the reality. There is not one true way. I've been asked over and over again, uh, I want to get a certificate in writing. And I say, there is not, there, there isn't one. Uh, well, what's the true way to do it? There's not a true way. Let me start off by saying, you, you are the expert. You are your own scientist. Find out what works. I am not gonna tell you one true way because there is no one true way and what might work today might not work tomorrow. Got it. Uh, there have been lots and lots of studies on this by me and by others, mostly others now. And I can tell you what has been shown to work on average, but it doesn't apply to you. So you, and I've always been a big believer in this, and this comes from, from Carl Rogers, a Rogerian approach to psychotherapy. You are responsible. You are responsible for your own problems. You got yourself into them, maybe not by choice, but you are the one who's gonna to have to be responsible to, to fight your way out. Wow, powerful. So here's, so what do we know? How many times should you write? I don't know. Why did I have you have people write four times Well, I told you? The one thing I wanted was I wanted this to be something that you would take in as a life course correction. Wow. In other words, when I hear about journaling or diary writing, I just yeah. get depressed. I get depressed because I don't want to write every day the rest of my life. Right. I know I won't do it. 
So, so the, the issue is for me, if, if I'm having problems with my spouse, if I'm having troubles at work, I'm going to go on the assumption they're not going to go on forever because if they do, that's, that is very bad. Right. Wonderful. I have a problem now and I want the problem fixed. And once it's fixed, I don't want to do more writing to me. Writing is yep. work. Writing is trying to understand something that's really painful and difficult. And once it's over, adios, I don't need to write anymore. If life is going well, I don't need to work through that. I'm just going to enjoy it. So to me, you know, I started off having people write four times and that worked. And then uh, I, I wanted to sh make it shorter. So I had him write three times instead of four times. Yes. That worked. I had him write 15 minutes, that worked, 20 minutes, that right worked, 30 minutes, that wow. worked. And then um, we started playing with other methods and other labs started playing with other methods. So one, one group at the University of Missouri had people write five minutes. Yeah. Worked. And uh, we've had people write 10 minutes and then they take a 10 minute break and then 10 minutes again, a 10 minute break and then 10 minutes yet again. All of them seem to be beneficial. Experiment. See what works best with you. I love those words of wisdom and what you just said. A couple of things, just to recap, that we really are, um, you know, whether it was our choice, the problem happened, we have some sense of accountability. Um, I, I love that part. And also, you just, I think you just wiped out five questions. I was going to ask you. <laughs> But that's the beauty in this is you've been doing this for so long and, and you know, like it or not, you are the, you are the foremost world renowned expert on this, but I love what you did. You gave it back to us. You said, listen here, buddy, you're responsible for this. You can write as long as you want. And that is the beauty of what I did when I was going through my grieving process with my brother loss. I wrote what felt right. And I remember taking breaks and going back. And, um, and maybe I wrote maybe once a day, twice a day, but, and then I came to writing maybe once or twice a week, if something bothered me, if there was, I couldn't sleep. I just got up um, and, and did that. Now, along the way you said, it doesn't matter if it's five minutes, 10 minutes. One of the things, uh, David Hanscom and I, David Hanscom is a surgeon who does, um, you know, pain recovery work now. He teaches people about pain and how to deal with it and how to uh, resolve it. One of the things we both do that we have in common is we carry like sometimes sticky notes. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but this is the wonderful part I'm sharing this with you is, and I've told this to my patients, if I'm in between patients and I'm still hung up about something or I just got out of a meeting with my boss or something like that, and something is rubbing me the wrong way, I'm trying to use my mind-body techniques, breathing, just feeling. Sometimes I need to get some distance from that thought. I'll crack up that little sticky sheet and I carry it with me frequently. I'll just kind of make circles. And as I'm talking about it, so it's not beautiful penmanship. And then I rip it up and I have this sense of, <sighs> so you're speaking the truth is that as we really know what to do, just do the work. You know, it's, it, it, it's funny. I was talking to a person who heard on hypnosis mm. and he said that some hypnotists will uh, before they start a session they'll have the person write down what's on their mind right then and then tear up what they've written because he finds that when he does that and when these, these other people do it it's it clears their mind so it's the same general idea that you're that you're using yeah that's wonderful. Uh, and, and tell us some more then. So these are the do's and don'ts and uh, I love, and basically you're saying is we have that full authority to do as much as do little. Uh, and I also love your real clear distinction. And um, because sometimes people mistake journaling for expressive writing and that everyday writing, you're right about that. Um, I find it very powerful from time to time when something does bug me and I'm feeling a lot of pressure to get some deadlines done and just kind of picking it up and just doing it um, as opposed to every single day, dear diary. Now, the, and, and for those of you who write out there, I'm, I'm not knocking journaling, that, that works for you so great as Dr. Panabaker is uh, saying, is but when we have things that we're hung up on that, that's stealing a sense of peace and joy, to get some sense of separation from it and to release it, 
um, is, is really important. In trauma therapy, uh, I'm, tra I'm a trauma-informed therapist, as Porges called me that, <laughs> so <laughs> Stephen Porges. And, um, he, and one of the things that um, Peter Levine, Stephen Porges, we talk about allowing the emotion to process through us and then releasing it, as opposed to having it stuck uh, so you're really speaking to a variety of worlds from medicine to psychology to trauma stuff. So it's amazing. Uh, that's very helpful. So mm -hmm. it, um, it, it's interesting that the metaphor that you use about getting rid of the emotion. I don't think of it that way. I think of it more as understanding the event. So let's mm -hmm. say that you've had uh, real tension with your somebody you're working with and this is really just messing up your life it makes so you don't want to go into work mm -hmm. uh, one of the issues is is if you write what what hopefully writing will do is it will turn the mirror on you as opposed to this the other person in other words gotcha. you have to ask the question why am I so upset about this? What, what is it about mm -hmm. this experience? Why there's something deeper that I'm dealing, I'm responding to, why is that? And so you start writing and if you're lucky, you at some point you go, oh, wow, well, this is the same thing that happened with my parents my, in right. dealing with them and this or that, the, the other. And once you understand it, the emotion just goes away. It's not that you're get that you're pushing the emotion out. It's just right. that your brain and body don't need that emotion anymore. And now you can move on. It no longer serves a, that purpose. Right. That's yeah. Right. No, absolutely. And, and, and believe me, I don't tell my patients to push thoughts away and emotions. One of the things we talk about is being able to acknowledge what's there and um, through writing or even any form of meditation for that matter is to allow that to, to release from you. Because just like you said, um, I, so I'm an act um, psychologist, act therapist, uh, acceptance commitment therapy. And we teach patients that reality is the emotions are there for a reason, much like what you said. The goal is to get some distance to be able to have some insight, right? Like, what is that about? Mm -hmm. I love how you said, how you said it was basically, if we take the mirror, and so this writing thing allows us to reflect on what's there. I've actually had several patients say exactly that. So the truth is exactly what you're saying. They've actually discovered that this is, uh, as we call it, maybe counter-transference in psychology. They recognize that their boss is like, hey, this is dad that used to kind of hyper-criticize me. And wow, this is my boss is my dad. And so they start to recognize that. And it's almost like they have an epiphany, like you said. Yeah. And they recognize that what they're dealing with and they can regulate themselves. So beautiful. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and one other thing, other aspect of this is don't think that writing is a panacea. It's not. Mm -hmm. uh, there are times, so mm -hmm. I write, you know, I write maybe once or twice a year when, when it's often when I'm having trouble sleeping or I'm tossing and turning about something. And very often I'll just get up, write for a while, and then get Love bored it. with it. Sleep. But there are times when I've started writing and afterwards I realized it didn't do any good. Well, let it go. You know, if, if writing isn't working for you, mm -hmm. if you afterwards you feel bad, as, you know, though you didn't accomplish anything, try something else. Go jogging, go you know, talk to a therapist, pray, do, try other things. Again, Love that. You are your own psychologist. And so that's one reason, by the way, why I always prefer writing a fixed number of times. Because if you write too much, it's almost like you become navel gazing. You start mm. just picking at a scab. And you yes. can only find miserable things about how you were unjustly treated. And you can make things worse. And that's the definition of depression, which is ruminating. And you don't want writing to turn into ruminating. You're, the approach, I think, needs to be more a problem-solving one, which is, why am I reacting this way? Why am I feeling this way? How is it related to other issues that have gone on in my life? 
How is it related to um, who I want to be or, or who I've been in the past or who I, who I am now? But really, again, as you're saying, standing back and looking at this to get a better understanding. Can you speak to the trauma in writing? What happens? What are your recommendations when you start feeling numbness or you're feeling worse as you're writing it? Um, what, what do you recommend tips and tricks? There? I have several things that I recommend occasionally. One of them is if you're writing, you know, you should be also paying attention to how you feel as you're writing. If you sure. feel as though you're starting to go down a rabbit hole, if you start feeling as though you're going someplace that you don't want to go, stop. You don't need to, you can, you, you can and should stop anytime. Yeah. If you feel as though something beneficial for you, go for it. In other words, you have to pay attention to yourself and, and ask yourself, is this something that's good for me? And you can push yourself a little bit, but there are sometimes uh, what I worry about the most is if somebody has spoken to a therapist or a friend or whatever, and they said, okay, you've had this thing, you need to write. And so yes. you take it like medicine. And so you start writing, you think, I hate this. This is not going to do me any good. And you start and you think, this is really bad for me. I shouldn't do it. But, but they told me to write. Don't write. Listen to yourself. Ignore those other voices. Is this beneficial for you? Now, now this gets to another issue. It gets to the, a couple of the questions that you've asked me. How should you write? First of all, can you, should you type it? Should you write, by, write it out longhand? Whatever. Doesn't matter to me. What are you most <laughs> comfortable with? Okay. Uh, turns out uh, I thought I had discovered it, but clearly some other people have too. I call it finger writing. Yes. So, uh, a few years ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, my wife and I were, uh, we were visiting, uh, you know, going to different places in Europe and we were staying in a, in a, kind of small hotel in a small room and I was something was bugging me and I thought I'd get up in the middle of the night and write but there's no place to write and mm -hmm. if I turn on the light it would have my wife would have gotten up and, and I just wanted to write so in the dark I just sat in a chair and started writing with my fingers and I was wow. amazed thinking wow that's really <laughs> great and I've since had hundreds of people do this and they report that it's as beneficial as writing by hand. Now, some people don't like it. Some people love it. And uh, one of the interesting things is uh, I've asked people, is there any difference in their writing? And a lot of them say, well, I notice I swear a lot more when I'm writing <laughs> with my finger than if it's on paper. And, and there's another issue that's not that I think, which is what do you do with your writing when you're finished right well, it's kind of hard was... because because that what you've created is is you you know that is part of you and most people the thought of throwing it away they just think oh my gosh this is I, I don't want to throw it away but the reality is if somebody some other people see it it could be damning it could be it could hurt hurt your reputation. It could yeah. hurt their feelings. There are all sorts of downsides. So I recommend to people when they start, plan to throw this away when they're when you're finished. Most people don't, uh, but put it in some really secure place that only you have access to it. Because these what you're writing is deeply personal, and it's also potentially threatening to others. I, the reason I prefer writing is that it's slower. And I think mm. with, with speaking, it means that you are processing information more quickly and sometimes more superficially. And right. writing slows the process down. Uh, now, this ties into what if you're bilingual or bilingual? What language should you write in? Uh, one of my graduate students, uh, Young Sook Kim, who's now a, uh, uh, 
a, a very well-known clinician uh, has did her dissertation where she had people write either in, she, she got people who were bilingual Spanish English or Korean English. Wow. She had them write either for four days in English only, in their native language only, or uh, flipping back and forth. So one day would be for the Spanish speakers, Spanish, the next day English and so forth, and the same thing for the Koreans. And she found a slight benefit for people who flipped between languages. So, and, and what people tell us is that when they write one day, say in Spanish, the next day in English and Spanish and so forth, uh -huh. is that by writing in the different language, it forces a different perspective. And one of the things that our research shows is perspective shifts are really helpful. Looking at the same mm -hmm. problem from different perspectives is, is beneficial. So if you have that ability to write in another language, try it out and see if it works. The same thing, some people, you know, in some therapeutic approaches, uh, Lucia Cappuccioni uh, used to, and she still talks about writing with your non-dominant hand. For most people, your left hand. I was hand. going to ask you about that because I've heard people speak about it. Um, yeah, and you know, and I've tried it myself. It doesn't do anything for me except make me look like I'm I'm an idiot. Uh, but some people really find it beneficial. Again, it's free. Yeah. Try it, and that's the truth. Again, all of these, all of these methods, experiment and see what works. You know, another one is uh, I went through a period experimenting uh, typing with the screen off, so I couldn't see what I was typing. Oh wow, and I've had that's to... a great idea. <laughs> I... And it, uh, it, it's a challenge, <clears throat> but uh, some people find that. Beneficial. I did not find that beneficial for me, but again, experiment. That, and that's what's so nice about all of this. We'll, we'll be coming to a wrap here. Dr. Pennebaker, is, um, are there any thoughts about um, for medicine and, and uh, you know, in the world of pain, uh, chronic pain, what, you know, are there any other thoughts or you think as far as studies, um, you know, you think you might um, like to see your work go into what do you think we need to do more of um, from your perspective as a scientist? I mean, what do you think we need to do? It's a broad, broad question. It's, it's a really broad <laughs> question. You know, what's so interesting is um, just the way science works. Um, historically, in, you know, in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, certainly in psychology, mm -hmm. the way therapy has moved forward, has, it's, it's been very difficult because so much of it has been based on questionnaires and self-reports. And, and when people are in these studies that are time consuming, they are biased to say that it really helps. Mm -hmm. and, and very few of these studies actually look to see if it makes any difference. So that, you know, somebody comes in and they're afraid of heights and they go through all of this training to make them so they're not afraid of heights. And that's great, but nobody ever goes to see, do they now drive over that high bridge? And it turns out they probably don't, but they say that the therapy helps. My sense is we need to keep experimenting, trying new methods, trying new ways of evaluating what works. And as a therapist, my approach, at, at, and as a non-therapist for me, but acting like a therapist, if I work with an individual case, I want to start off with, so I don't really care how you feel. I want to know what you're doing. What are the problems? You, you're afraid of swimming? Okay, let's try to get you to swim. Are you having problems with this? Let's see if we can get, you know, in other words, come up with some some behavioral or biological or other markers and use that as the index. If you say uh, you still feel afraid, but you're swimming, my attitude, 
okay, I've, I've done what I, what I intended. And you go ahead and feel afraid of my that. problem. Yeah. So it, it's a, you know, I've always called it the taxpayer's perspective. The taxpayer's perspective. <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, the, they're historically the, they're the right, the, the more conservatives in government have been pretty contemptuous about psychology. And I mm -hmm. think one reason is so much of psychology has been based on questionnaires. Oh, my self-esteem is low. And that the, the, the Republican says, big deal, tough, you know, <laughs> get over it. Well, I'm not a, a Republican, but I kind of agree with that, which is show me the money. If yeah. your therapy can make you go to the doctor less, make you work more, make you a better parent, make you drink less, smoke less, I'm going to pay attention. Wow. And if I can bring about changes in meaningful behaviors that are good for society, I think that is, that's what we should all strive for. You know, if your self-esteem goes up, whoop de doo that's great. But that's not why I'm here. <laughs> I want you to be a better human being. Wow, I I, I think um, I, I might be looking at myself here because that's that's the way it's, I love how you just put that. Listen, you might not know this, but uh, you're not only a, a therapist. Um, you're I'm officially dubbing you this: the honorary acceptance and commitment therapist, uh, treatment therapist. You sound. This is what we do in ACT. In ACT, we it's a behavioral, um, you know, evidence-based treatment. And we teach patients, uh, I have a saying, take your doubt, take your fear, take your emotions, acknowledge them, but put them in your pocket and keep doing. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, I, and I love that. You just, you just validated everything. <laughs> and coming from you, that's even great. So listen, this is fantastic. And I, and I sincerely, I know you're a busy individual, but just taking this time this today, this morning, to be able to chat with you, and I know uh, my patients, my viewers uh, are very appreciative of what you have said today. And I feel, this sounds ridiculous, just conversating with you, I feel a little lighter. So um, that <laughs> there isn't so many restrictions on the do's and don't do this and don't write past 21 minutes. Yeah, and yeah. you can air write, you can tow write. I'm sure people will be coming up in different ways. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to solemnly say one more time, just to close the circle out, is for your time, your effort, and the and the gift that you've actually given the world. Uh, and I'll say this till my last breath. I'm indebt indebted to you and grateful, and thank you so much for coming on this. Well, thank program. you. I'm I'm, I'm touched what you I'm touched by what you said, and I really appreciate appreciate what you're doing. Great, thank you, Dr. Van Baker. Again, for those of you, it's a true service to have you here today. Uh, I'll catch you the next moment. I'm Dr. Les.